Remember the good old days when the sisterhood was on the march? Back in 1968, the female staff at the Ford plant in Dagenham set the standard. We're on the lowest rate in the whole of the bleeding factory, despite the fact we got considerable skill. Yeah. And there's only one possible reason for that. It's because we're women. Yeah. This strike is about one thing, and one thing only. Fairness. Yeah. Equal pay or nothing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All those in favour? The machinists walked out of the factory and into the annals of feminist history. Their story has just been released at the cinema as Made in Dagenham. The movie evokes a time when women fought alongside each other, noisily, often joyously, a time when feminism lent itself to a feel-good film script. It did feel good to be a feminist once. Try being one these days. Often people make some kind of joke regarding my sexuality. You know, it's, oh, I didn't know you were a lesbian, or... Why isn't your hair shaved off? Other times people have laughed. Quite frankly, you know, I've been told to get over it. People can be very aggressive. You'll get threats, you'll get called stupid. Some feminists get rape threats, death threats, just purely for writing about feminism. Hear comments like that and you wonder what happened to turn the tide from the boisterous activism of the second wave to the beleaguered, low-key feminism of today. In recent times, I've noticed friends, including many independent, forceful women, almost recoiling at any mention of the term. Where did all my sisters go? In this programme, we'll hear from a number of women, campaigners and academics, students and grandmothers, and explore politics, pornography and patriarchy as we try to understand why feminism has sunk beneath the radar. Angela McRobbie is Professor of Communications at Goldsmiths College London and one of the country's foremost commentators on feminism and culture. She watched Dismayed as feminism became a dirty word in the 1980s and 90s. At absolutely every possible moment where the word feminism appeared in popular culture, in the press, on television, inside politics, the kind of hideous spectre of the old anti-male feminist was conjured. This was incredibly powerful because it was so associated with being unattractive and being old that most women disidentified with it. And it was particularly young women disidentified with it because, after all, who would want to be seen as this kind of hideous creature? I'm quite happy to be a hideous creature. I'd been a shoulder pad type of feminist in the 80s, serious about freedom, which felt new and fragile. Then came the 90s, and it was as though we all relaxed, secure enough now in our freedom to be who we wanted to be. Catherine Redfern was a teenager then. She's a feminist who recently co-authored a book called Reclaiming the F Word. She wasn't impressed by the new feminist accessories, wonder bras for some, beer goggles for others. You had this kind of idea that women had it all, and you had this idea of the ladettes who were kind of being like men, going out and drinking and just having fun. But at the same time, you had this real pushing of this idea that men and women are separate species almost. So you had this sort of Mars and Venus idea of men and women. So we became more segregated. And I do think it was a backlash. The idea that men and women are essentially different to such a degree that they could be from different planets gained support in the 1990s from the academic discipline of evolutionary psychology. Crudely boiled down, boys will be boys, and there's not much we can do about it. The theory found its expression in popular form in books such as Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. No doubt its message influenced plenty of women to accept traditional stereotypes as inevitable. But feminist consciousness didn't die with the century. As a response to the 90s backlash, Catherine Redfern set up one of the first UK feminist websites in 2001 and called it The F Word. She was a pioneer because the 21st century fight back is largely taking place on the internet. She's conducted a survey of 1,200 self-confessed feminists. When we did our survey, we found that 63%, I think it was, were in their 20s or under younger women are really heavily involved in pushing forward this new new feminist groups and new organizations so to say that younger women generally are apathetic is not true the internet has played a key role in attracting younger women to feminism if it's mainly happening on the internet though is there a danger possibly that the the women who are going to those websites or the men indeed are already people who are interested in feminism 
Not necessarily, because um, on the F word, for example, we get emails from people saying, oh, you've changed my mind, actually. I've been reading all these feminist blogs. It's had a major impact on me. Now I'm a feminist. It's been great. Better virtual activism than no activism at all. But of the feminists Catherine Redfern surveyed, an astonishing 90% were educated to graduate or postgraduate level, a far cry from the 60s Dagenham strikers. This doesn't prove that modern feminism is now an elitist sorority, but it does go some way to explaining why current debates are so cerebral, conducted mainly in internet chat rooms and in universities, rather than on the car factory floor. Lizzie Dearden is a young feminist and in her final year of an English literature degree at York University. She's also a contributor to the F Word website. What's her experience of feminism on campus? I've encountered maybe one or two people of my own age at university who openly identify with being a feminist. That isn't enough for a sisterhood. And all the activism is online. Sometimes I think the concentration of activism that's there isn't that helpful. You're sort of detached. There doesn't feel like there's a collective group working for a collective aim anymore. The lack of direction makes it difficult for people to want to be involved. It's perhaps not that surprising that Lizzie's friends aren't engaging with the feminist fight because the battle appears to be won. They've grown up with an unparalleled amount of legal equality. But according to Anne Phillips, Professor of Political and Gender Theory at the London School of Economics, young women are in danger of taking their position for granted. I don't think there is an enormous emphasis on fighting for gender equality. I think that people have sort of slipped back into an idea of sort of gradual improvements, more equal pay, more equal political representation, more visibility of women in various kind of positions of influence. You know, actual equality just seems a long way off people's agenda. Clearly one of the really big changes that's happened over recent decades is the change in terms of men's and women's participation in education. I mean, that's been an extraordinary transformation, the fact that girls are now more likely than boys to stay in at school, do well, higher proportion of women than men in universities. And maybe in some way that's kind of creating a sense of complacency about all the other things that are going on. One of those things being the fact that women are going to suffer disproportionately from the budget cuts announced in June. Perhaps the complacency that Professor Phillips detects is the reason why there are no banner-waving women descending on Parliament Square. But the professional campaigners are concerned. The Fawcett Society is Britain's highest profile women's lobby group. Its chief executive is Kerry Goddard. We know that the emergency budget raised about eight billion in revenue, of which over five billion, just over 70 percent, is going to come directly from women's pockets. And um, I think that will impact on all women, but particularly some of the women that already have least single parents, black minority, ethnic women, women who are living in poverty. It could literally shift back women's economic independence a generation. And that's not counting the further cuts to be announced on the 20th of this month. Not all economists agree on that 70% figure, which came from research commissioned by Shadow Minister Yvette Cooper from the House of Commons Library. But they do agree that it's going to be much tougher for women than men. Kerry Goddard believes it'll push back women's independence, and she may well be right, but the reality is that women as a group have never escaped financial dependence, whether on men or on the state. Why? Professor Anne Phillips from the LSE. Women remain the carers in society. And what that means is moving into part-time work, greater dependency on benefits and welfare systems. That's kind of one aspect. But the other aspect is that it 